So I'm going to talk about Apache on Terrasu. Um, really, as it says, start treating your data pipelines as code. Basically, I'm going to talk about how you can, uh, how we can uh, put into uh, work all the principles we have from uh, CI and CD into the uh, data science world. Now, that's something that is a bit lacking, let's say, um, as it is now. So, let's go. So, apparently, in uh, 2016, it was estimated that 60% uh, of the big data projects are not going to make it through piloting. Sadly, that wasn't really, it was an um, underestimation of that uh, number. In 2017, we actually found out it's 85% of the projects simply didn't make it through piloting. So you probably ask yourself, well, why? I mean, come on, it's only a project and like uh, we've done project in the past, right? Well, it's not that simple. So what's gone wrong? Meet Susie. Susie is a data scientist. Now, Susie wants to build a module. She wants to build a model using TensorFlow. Well, that's great. In order to build the model, well, it might come as a surprise to you as a data community, you need data. So she goes around, she looks for someone to give her, to be able to uh, gather data in a principled way. She goes around, she finds John, who is a data engineer. Well, great. So she asks him, well, dear John, can you please uh, gather data on this and that and that for me? Fine. So he goes to his sources, databases, systems, social media, and he gathers them using, well, Spark. Fine. Meanwhile, while Susie is waiting, she's gonna base her uh, model on some uh, subsets, small subsets of data. Well, everything looks fine. Except, finally, we have a problem. It's called data dependencies. So she has a model and John is collecting uh, data. And when he's done, he gives her his data. At this point, she finds out the harsh truth, which is the subset she used wasn't nearly big enough to represent the, the reality, the world that they're working. And she now needs to do everything again. That sucks. So, yeah, and she does that and then she finds out, well, my model is great, but it's not good enough because I need more features. She goes back to John, John does his magic, gets her uh, data on more features. She, he brings it, uh, delivers it uh, to uh, Susie, fine. Now, eventually, when they are finally ready for uh, production, they have this uh, little, Jessica, the ops girl. Now, Jessica, you know, she has all the knows about of uh, deployment, integration, all of that. So she goes and she wants to deploy uh, this little system onto the clusters. Well, as it turns out, uh, they have different development environments. One was uh, using Spark, one is using uh, TensorFlow, it requires different clusters. Um, and well, this is only like when you are a small, small, small team, but think about a company that, that has big teams of uh, data science and they all have to interact together and integration becomes hell. So yeah, so she goes and she deploys everything fine. Now, given that this process took about, let's say uh, a few good months, and meanwhile, uh, business requirements have changed and this entire process is basically down the drain. Uh, life is not good. So this is where we come. All right. So we know we have development, we have operations. In the middle, we have this DevOps. This is something we've practiced for, for years. Now it's nothing new. We have all kinds of solutions there, like uh, Chef and Puppet and Jenkins and all things and Ansible, whatever. This, this uh, thing is solved. However, when you go and you 
put data science into uh, this equation, things aren't that simple. Um, let's say data scientists uh, usually are not engineering guys and usually they're obviously not operation guys. And last thing you want to happen is your data scientist uh, deploying stuff to production. That's probably going to end up as a disaster. Uh, actually, it will. And usually they depend on others to uh, build a process around their uh, algorithms and around their models. Um, now, a, big, a sad truth is that have you ever seen a software engineer who has nothing to do with data science, right? Talking to a data scientist. Well, you probably have. And it's kind of like uh, trying to uh, speak uh, uh, Klingon uh, on one end and, um, and uh, Elfish, I don't remember the actual uh, language name, but never mind, on the other end. So basically, yeah, it doesn't work. And obviously, if you ever, actually, no, you haven't seen a data scientist trying to talk to an ops guy, that's, that simply is a complete and utter disaster. So we come exactly in this sweet spot, right? We go in this sweet spot, data ops. So uh, data ops is really the center between all of them. How to uh, get your uh, workloads into production in a principled and safe way, okay? While obviously you have to take into account stuff like uh, your local development environment and things like that. So this is where we come to play. So Apache Amaterasu, we have actually, uh, we are incubating, we have uh, been accepting to Apache like uh, six months ago. Um, we give you a configuration tool and a, and a deployment tool, right? So our uh, big vision is that with a one-liner, you can deploy your stuff uh, to production in one hand, run it the same way in the, your testing environment and the same way in your local uh, development environment. Almost seamlessly. So how do we do it? Well, we have Susie. So Susie wants to work on her uh, uh, usual TensorFlow uh, workload. And we have John who is working on the Spark uh, workload. And what the difference in, uh, in how they work now is that they actually work with a Git repository. Now this Git repository has a very, very, very specific structure. So this structure uh, is basically defines how the job should run and how it should run on different environments. And we go and we run it for them using uh, any underlying infrastructure. It could be uh, um, Hadoop and it could be uh, DCOS and all kinds of other curse words that you can find, right? So, our uh, nice little guys, so they have worked independently. They push into a remote repository where Amaterasu can uh, access. So it could be, uh, well, this GitHub. It could be some uh, Git uh, uh, somewhere on inside your organizational uh, infrastructure, wherever. And uh, when they want to run, they simply run this. Just I'm a run and they give the uh, URL of the repository, they say, well, the uh, env is development, fine. Then when they are satisfied with all of that, they go uh, to Jessica, they tell her, well, please deploy it for us. All she does is this, she just runs it, given that she has installed the uh, Apache Amatras on the cluster first, but that's another thing, that's another, another tale. So, great. Uh, she execu executes it for Sparkrust and TensorFlow, everyone's happy. So how does it work? Um, so the repositories are pretty simple. Uh, we have a YAML file that describes the workflow, the Mac YAML. We have a folder for, uh, source, uh, for source code. We have uh, an environment folder for defining uh, different uh, environment, uh, like uh, uh, development, testing. By the way, you could have, obviously, you could uh, define different environments for uh, your Hadoop cluster uh, for one set of production uh, uh, machines, and uh, let's say a DCOS cluster, and maybe you just want to run it on, I don't know, somewhere else. Um, dependencies, 
for everything you need to run your job. So any uh, Python libraries, packages, or uh, Scala pack, uh, libraries, or whatever. Um, and why we use Git, that's probably, uh, that, that's obvious. I mean, why, why wouldn't you use Git? So this is how it looks right now in version uh, 2.0, where we are right now. Um, so we have a job, we define it, uh, we have a flow, Every, the flow is, uh, uh, consists of actions. Actions uh, define what, uh, what to run, uh, what kind of, uh, of, pay, of a workload to run. So right now we, we only support uh, uh, Spark, but we support uh, Spark with Scala, we support uh, uh, PySpark, we support uh, Spark R. Um, sorry, not Spark R, Spark SQL. Spark R we don't support, sorry. Um, we can export, we can, uh, we do, we do uh, export of uh, data for you. So you don't have to do any integration code in your uh, source code. And we can also load it for you. You'll see it uh, later on. And error handling that is uh, related to the action it's put on. Um, so I want to stress something out. We are not a workflow engine, right? So yes, we do deal with pipelines, but we do not deal with workflows. We are not trying to replace uh, Airflow or stuff like this. We may use Airflow, but we are not going to replace them for sure. Um, and we know that, well, data applications depend on other data applications. That's how it works. That's how life works. So pipelines not workflow. We already said that. And in our next version, hopefully a few months away, Hope we are gonna support uh, long-running tasks and scheduled tasks, which is something we do not support right now. Right now, we only support uh, uh, on-demand invoke tasks. Obviously, anything you used to hear will be also uh, be able. Uh, we can run it on demand. Uh, type is long-running, but you can also have scheduled actions inside this long-running task. Uh, you can uh, import actions from uh, other uh, from JALs, for example. So DSL, um, yeah. So how do we do it? We run. We know how to run uh, Scala, uh, Python, and Spark and uh, SQL. What we do basically is we define a context that is shared among all the actions in the job, right? So we already give you a Spark context and a SQL context, and you can have a lot of fun with that. Now, um, regarding the uh, how you actually connect actions, so anything that was uh, outputted in a previous action, you can access in the next action using a data frame, right? Um, so this is how it looks in Scala, pretty simple. Um, no integration code whatsoever, except with uh, our code, but something really tiny, so almost seamless. Um, as you can see, the ODD at the end uh, is exported out. It's, it basically you tell it what, what variable you want to, act, to export. Um, and then in the next action, we pull it with a get data frame, and we can continue uh, the job. All right now, PySpark, same thing, different convention, but same thing. Um, Spark SQL due to limitation of uh, SQL. Um, that's how we do it. Uh, th this is basically the second step already. It's on the first one, so you can continue from. Uh, by the way, you can have one action as Scala and another action is SQL, another action is PySpark, doesn't matter. Right, environments. So uh, they are stored as YAML files. Um, what we require you to define is only really three things. The input and output pass. Input is like where you wanna, if you want to get uh, data from somewhere as an input for the job, like HDFS or somewhere in your local file system, in, if, in the case you're running on development. And uh, output path, same thing. Working directory, for example, somewhere in HDFS, Alex Leo, everything's fine. Um, and anything you want to pass in into the job as uh, environment variables. And this is how environment uh, YAML looks like. So you have input path, uh, output, working directory, configurations, when you connect to Cassandra, for example. Uh, this is what you would use, for example, in your development environment. So it's, it's really, it, it can give you a, basically what it does is uh, you can have seamless, uh, this enables us to give you the seamless uh, uh, running environment. 
Right. So uh, how you access this? How you access any environment uh, variable? So we give you this env uh, singleton, which is loaded from uh, our uh, uh, process. And then you can access anything you want on this env. All right. So right now, we, we, uh, our recent version that is being released right in these days, actually, which is a, a 2.0, we support, uh, we, we, use, we used to only support Mesos, now we support Yarn, which means we can run on a dupe. Uh, we only supported the uh, Spark uh, Scala, now we support uh, SQL and PySpark. We're not gonna support Yarn for now. Um, uh, sorry, R for now. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we used to store all our configurations in JSON, which is unreadable. So we moved over to YAML. Uh, you can pass, uh, in this version, you can pass any um, configuration related to Spark onwards. And we have an SDK if you want to uh, join us and uh, develop, I know, for example, uh, integration with TensorFlow, which would be nice. Um, okay, the next version. Next versions, actually. So upcoming is a new CLI. And um, the long-running uh, pipelines uh, that we, uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Kubernetes, right? And uh, TensorFlow, Flink, Beam, all the things, if you want it, tell us, hopefully we'll make it. And more SDK improvements, including an SDK in Python, right? And how, how you get to us? So actually the presentation uh, will be available through, uh, I guess, through uh, the, con the convention somewhere, or if not, I will upload it later on to my, uh, uh, I will post a link on my Twitter account. Um, that's it. Okay, any questions? So this problem try to solve the different uh, the, the skill set that required to, to, to find a good, uh, a good structure to combine the skill set that is required to build the data platform, right? I'm not trying to, to replace it. Um, no, not to replace it. We, we are trying to make life easier for all uh, um, parties involved. So data scientists want them to want to give them a seamless environment where, where they can just, I mean, continue developing code as they used to develop. We don't want them going into thinking like, how can I run this in production? It's, they're not supposed to think about this. I mean, that's what you have operation guys for, right? But I think, okay, so I didn't understand exactly how does it solve this problem. That's, that's what I'm missing. Like, I can tell them, tell the data, Scientist, write a Python script. Yeah. Give it to me, and I'll run it in production as the ops guy or the. the yeah, but but the difference is that uh, we want to give the uh, well for some. Uh, so one thing is we want to give the uh, data scientist the ability to uh, run his stuff on development environment and then on testing environment where it doesn't need to call the ops guy to. Uh, well, can you please deploy this to to testing? Well, it doesn't make any sense, right? So. Um, we want to give this ability uh, as just a one-liner that you can run, all right? And then... So he runs from his local environment? Right now, no. Right now, no. But we do have uh, plans for remote execution. So it means that you could run, uh, you could use the CLI to execute uh, remote tasks, remote jobs, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah. Eventually. So what I'm trying to understand is exactly what what exactly does it show? The exact because I didn't see like. A we try to basically. Um, we try to. Um, well, for starters, um, we try to get integration done. From day zero, right? This gives you the ability to do integration from, from day zero. Now this gives you the ability to do uh, to basically uh, go into iter short iterative um, um, sorry short short iterations, right? From uh, uh, start to deployment, which is what we do in uh, in, this, in software engineering. Basically, if you are working in the in agile method methodologies, you want to give uh, you want to get those tools into data science, right? So this is something that so far. Uh, the data science community is tending towards a uh, waterfall uh, model. 
at least in what I've seen. So it takes a lot of time until um, your workload actually makes it to production. And by the time it gets there, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it's uh, either it's not relevant, or if it's relevant, it's, it, you have to immediately uh, go and replace it with another version because it doesn't uh, supply the full uh, set of features you want it to supply, and insights. So we want to try to do it uh, from day zero. You, you mentioned at the start, part of the... Uh, Part of the uh, added value is uh, having data as part of a dependency. Yeah. Where was that? Uh, All right. So you see here where, where I uh, export data. I can then later on use it in another action. Okay. Ah, so, so essentially you save it uh, uh, files in Git. What? So. The, the initial data. The initial data you supply. We're, we're not gonna solve. We're not gonna write the code for you, but we are gonna run it for you, and we are gonna manage dependencies while executing the job for you. Oh, part of the problem is that the initial conditions for development and production have to be the same. So the the data, the data scientist. Well, obviously the data is not going to be the same in development and the, the production. I mean, you cannot have a full blown data set on your local machine, right? So basically, on your local development, maybe you want to use a, a relatively small but representing data set. So what gets deployed? The, the model. What? What gets deployed? The model. Uh, the entire job actually gets deployed, but uh, in the output, what you get is depends on what you define in the job. The job doesn't uh, have to end with a model, depends on what you want to do. I mean, it's not only for models. It can be, for example, if you wanted to uh, end up with, uh, um, I don't know, dumping a huge CSV file because you are doing uh, some cleanings of data, some tanning of data. Could be anything. We're not trying to uh, be strictly going with uh, models. That's what you're asking. Great. <laughs> <laughs>